visitor into the meeting or do you want me to wait until my you're muted I was looking at the wrong um, screen. Uh, yeah, it should be fine. I think I'm seeing everyone signing on. Your audio. Pending. Morning, Rachel. It's Maya here. Morning, Maya. Good morning, Ms. Wilford. Can you hear me? Good morning, Ms. Wilford. Are you able to hear me? Good morning, Brett. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Rachel? I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear both of you. I can hear everybody too. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, Ms. Wilford. Can you hear me? Hi, Paul, are you able to mic mute your microphone, please? Ms. Wilford, can you hear me? You might have to unmute your microphone to respond. Thank you very much. You can just keep it muted and then um, when there's an opportunity for questions, you can, I'll let you know. It's 9.30 and we're live whenever you're ready, Ms. Gray. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to start. Thank you to the one member of the public that is participating um, today uh, in this meeting. This is our first uh, trial of doing a budget, a virtual budget open house due to COVID this this COVID situation this year. So um, we will work through this and, and see how this goes. Appreciate all the directors and staff being on the call here um, and uh, participating in this budget open house. So I just wanted to start by um, thanking you for joining us this morning. 
Uh, we are privileged to be meeting on the traditional unceded territory of the Souk Nation. My name is Rachel Gray, and I am the Director of Finance. The order of activities for this session will begin with an introduction of the budget process. Um, department leads will share highlights of key projects captured in the 2021 budget, and then we will answer um, any resident questions that we have. Uh, we've, we have a few written questions and would be happy to answer any other uh, questions from participants in the meeting today. Um, the purpose of today's session is to learn about the opportunities and constraints the district is faced with heading into another ambitious year and a year where we continue to respond to the global pandemic. Council identified the district's mission to be a compassionate, engaged and effective organization, providing excellent public services to its citizens by maintaining our strong sense of identity, maintaining our growth for generations to come, and making our local economy diverse and resilient. The district manages an annual budget of $9.1 million for 2021 and provides municipal services and infrastructure that touches many aspects of daily life. These services include road and district maintenance, sewer system management, policing, fire, department operations, bylaw, parks and trails care and development and building and planning services. Today, we're talking about how your money is spent and how we are addressing the needs of today while also planning for the future. The projects and services that take place in the district influence our local economy through jobs, whether those are district positions or with contracts and creating spaces that enhance Souk's ability to develop a stronger local economy. In addition to the noted services, uh, the district also provides funding to local organizations for the benefit of the community. We have certainly seen these organizations step up in a very big way during the COVID-19 pandemic. The Stooge Food Bank, who supports uh, many local families in need, is one example. The list would be long to name them all, um, but I'm sure many have seen the results of their efforts and how important they are to Souk. Uh, throughout the year, long-range planning and research information, uh, research informed the district's budget. We have also have the benefit of being informed by your participation in September's citizen budget survey and through the development of the transportation and parks and trails master plans, which council approved in October. Uh, thank you to those who participated throughout these processes and who are participating again today. The annual budget process allows us to look at our plans comprehensively and determines how we execute these plans and maintain our core service delivery in the most fiscally, fiscally responsible way. Each year is a continual, continual balancing act to maintain core services and respond to our growing community. In spite of the pandemic, our assets and infrastructure mature and there are cost pressures to maintain the existing infrastructure while also developing new infrastructure. With that, I will um, just get into a general overview of the uh, presentation and then I will turn it over to the department heads who will speak in further detail on their uh, prospective departments. And at the end of the uh, session, we can uh, respond to or take any questions that have come in. I uh, just bear with me for one second and I will share my screen and get the presentation started. You may need to try that one more time. Oh, sorry, I think I see it now. It's now visible. Oh, perfect. All right, is that the full screen option there? No, you've we have can see the main slide oh, and then the next slide. Try that again. Better? That looks good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. OK. So in today's uh, presentation, I will just provide a general overview uh, and touch upon the consolidated summary section, the debt servicing, uh, reserve transfers, revenue, and a brief highlight um, touch on the capital planning for 2021 to 2025. I will leave it to uh, the departments to speak in a further detail on the specific uh, capital projects uh, in the current budget. So 
it was a general overview of our consolidated summary. Um, this, this pie chart shows the distribution of uh, 2021 proposed property taxes by department. And this includes $526,000 or 5.7% of the budget for council. Um, included in council's uh, budget is over $300,000 that is issued to community organizations through either the annual community grant program, uh, various line items and uh, community service agreements. Uh, the next piece of the pie would be the uh, CAO um, department, which has a budget of $365,000 or 4% of the overall budget. And a significant portion of their budget is they are the holders of the legal budget for the district, which is currently forecasted in the budget of $137,700 in 2021. Uh, the next department would be the uh, Office and Administration Department, and that includes our HR department and uh, property maintenance. And their significant portion of their budget would be the uh, property maintenance portion, which is uh, operating budget of $125,000 next year. Uh, next, we have Legislative Services, whose budget is $546,528 in 2021, or 5.9% uh, of the budget. And they hold uh, the budget for um, various office supplies and communication um, activities that the district engages in throughout the year. As well, they have the uh, bylaw department and they're responsible for the, they have two bylaw officers that are in and out and about in the community enforcing the district's various bylaws. Uh, the next department would be the uh, finance department, which includes financial administration and information technology. Um, two bigger inputs in, in those budgets would be uh, the ins annual insurance premiums, which is currently budgeted at $155,000. And this would be for our um, property insurance. Um, <clears throat> as well, we have the information technology budget and uh, a significant portion of that budget, uh, $140,000 is from software licensing that is required, especially now as we're trying to be more virtual um, and more connected through cloud services. Uh, the uh, next department would be the uh, operations department and uh, they represent um, $698,000 of our budget or 7.6% once they get uh, credit for certain revenues that are collected. And a couple of significant um, inputs into their budget would be the uh, highway maintenance contract, which is uh, currently uh, contracted at $364,140 for 2021. Uh, the next department, which the community will see more um, out there, would be the Parks Department, and their annual budget for 2021 is $921,942, or 10% of the budget. And a significant portion of their budget um, would be for materials and parks, materials and supplies, hazardous, hazardous vegetation control, and uh, seasonal adornment activities that occur, occur throughout the community. Uh, the next department would be the RCMP. And so their budget uh, is a contract um, that the district is, is entered into with the RCMP to deliver the RCMP services to the community. Uh, as well, we have the fire department and their budget is $2.3 million or 25.2% of the annual um, property taxes collected. And a significant portion of their budget um, is, is for the uh, firefighter staffing costs, as well as um, volunteer firefighter costs and various um, equipment and maintenance that the uh, fire department needs to do on the trucks, et cetera, that they have in their fleet. Uh, the next department I'll just briefly touch on would be the planning and development department. So their annual budget is um, $618,000 and they are um, responsible. They include uh, building safety subdivision and the planning um, department, which is most of the departments that the um, developing community will deal with when they are um, working with the district to construct uh, new property or make renovations to current properties. Um, 
And uh, the final department would be the communications department, which is a new department for 2021 um, for the district. And um, this is just separating out. We have hired a specific uh, uh, dedicated communications position in the district um, with the support of council to help better engage with the community and provide more consistent and uh, meaningful communication with uh, the residents of Souk. So everyone will know uh, how your tax dollars are being spent and the, and be informed of various other activities that the district is engaging in and spending your hard earned tax property tax revenue on. Um, and just wanted to make a special note of there is a, for as far as the capital projects, there's over $7 million of capital projects included in the 2021 budget and um, due to uh, the COVID safe restart grant that the district received, we will not be required to fund uh, any of these capital projects with property taxes in 2021. Uh, next, I'll just provide a quick overview of the current debt that the district is um, has. And so we have three uh, current debts for fire trucks. There is a debt for the uh, ladder truck of current balance of at December 31st, 2019 was $295,000 and this debt matures in 2027. There is a water tender truck, the current debt of $305,000 and that debt matures in 2024. There is a uh, new debt for the new engine one of $840,000 and that will mature in 2025. For those three um, debts, the total annual debt payments the district makes is $292,000. Um, there is $426,000 remaining on the Lot A property purchase debt, which will mature uh, in 2021. And the annual debt payments for that uh, is $143,000. Uh, the last debt that is currently on the district's books would be for the sewer plant. And that is at $3.8 million as of December, 2019, and it matures in 2026. And the total annual debt payments for the sewer debt is $450,000. Uh, included in the budget is uh, new debt is anticipated in 2023 to fund the purchase of a replacement engine 204. And in 2025, to fund the district's portion of the significant roads projects that we are hoping to undertake. Um, debt for the sewer expansion is unknown at this time. We have an estimate in there, um, but the district is waiting for confirmation of a significant grant funding to confirm what the final district contribution to that project may be if we are successful in that grant. Um, just a quick touch on reserve. So reserve funds, um, as you can see, we transfer, uh, this budget proposes transferring $4.7 million to reserves and transferring $5.4 million from the reserves into general operating. Uh, reserves are used to save money for future year projects and most have specific bylaws attached to them that dictates which funds are deposited to the reserve and what the funds can be used for. Uh, transfers to reserves um, are higher than average. Normally they're about $2 million, uh, but 2021 has a higher transfer due to the $2.981 million COVID-19 safe restart grant the district has received, um, which is great news for, for the district and the community. Um, some examples of transfers to reserves uh, would include, uh, every year we get an annual contribution of casino revenue for $260,000. We have uh, estimated $480,000 being received in roads and wastewater DCCs and $295,000 annually is transferred uh, to the capital asset replacement reserve. And the transfers from reserves include uh, $4.6 million in capital projects and an, an additional $328,000 for COVID related uh, operating costs. And just uh, briefly touching on the revenue piece here. Um, so as far as revenue, most of the lines are, are fairly stable, but there was some increases included in the 2021 budget. Uh, the first would be the addition of $20,000 to uh, for Robbins parking revenue. And this is forecasted to be received by the district uh, for the pay parking that was installed at the Soup Potholes parking lot uh, earlier this year. As well, um, just based on the growth of the community and the continued growth, uh, the building permit fees revenue has increased $75,000 over 2021. 
And again, on that vein of more development in souk and based on prior years uh, revenue, uh, the roads DCC funds um, have increased $100,000. Uh, for reference, the roads DCCs are governed by a bylaw that can only be used for projects within that bylaw. And the last piece here before I get into, uh, we'll hand it over to uh, our CAO, uh, Mr. McInnes, who can touch on the council CAO and administration departments would be, I'll just uh, briefly touch on the capital department. And so the total 2021 20, capital projects are totaling $7.1 million. As I stated earlier, zero projects are funded by property taxes. Of those $2.5 million are grant contingent. There is $1.7 million in roads DCC projects and $1.4 million in gas tax projects. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. McInnes, or who can discuss the CAO, uh, Council and Administration Departments. Thank you, Ms. Gray, and uh, thank you, Mrs. Welford, for joining us today. It's, uh, it's great to have an audience to hear all of this information. Uh, what I'm going to do with my piece of the budget is just basically go over the uh, significant changes from last year's budget. So the first piece in 2021 budget is there is a decrease of $10,000 uh, in the council budget due to anticipated travel uh, that will still be restricted uh, for COVID-19. Uh, the same happened when we uh, amended the 2020 budget. Uh, some of the training uh, dollars went away. And although we have our fingers crossed that sometime in 2021, we can get back to uh, in-face meetings. Uh, we have a, a decrease in the budget. And uh, we are seeing that, uh, you know, sometimes that, you know, this training dollars, they're, they're questioned from time to time, but we really are seeing firsthand right now, the impacts of not having things like the Union of uh, British Columbia Municipalities and training opportunities like the uh, uh, the Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities, the local government leadership academy, and it's just really really important to have those pieces, those uh, to touch base and uh, do governance check-ins with colleagues and and networks. And we are uh, extremely happy to have Mayor Tate online with us today. And I'll just ask Mayor Tate if she wants to say a word about the council budget. Um, thank you, Mr. McInnes. Um, I'm, I don't have anything prepared, so maybe what I'll do is I'll just ask questions if there's anything further about it and, um, and just appreciate your and staff carrying on. If that's all right. Perfect. Uh, so that decrease for the council budget, it uh, represents a 0.12% decrease uh, in property taxes over last year's budget. Uh, the second piece in uh, that I'm responsible for uh, is the office of the CAO and a uh, significant change uh, in the 2021 budget uh, as uh, Ms. Gray alluded to is the introduction of a community economic development officer. So if uh, the budget is approved on Monday night and uh, is ultimately adopted on uh, January 11th as we anticipate, uh, that will be a new position. Uh, there's also a $15,000 uh, increase to project budgets uh, to give some money to the Community Economic Development Officer and our new Community Economic Development Committee uh, that will be constituted on uh, Wednesday night or Monday night as well on December 14th uh, to give them some seed money to take on a, a little bit of project work. Uh, and Ms. Gray, are you able to click on that YouTube video and uh, hopefully it will play? We'll see how technology works for us today. I will try here and see. Okay. Is that showing up on your screen? Maybe I'll have to drag it. Yes. Showing up there now? Yes. Oops. Sorry, one second. Let me try that one more time. No sound though. Um, I 
wonder. I believe it's because you are probably using your microphone for sound. Oh, I'm not okay. sure you're going to be able to achieve sound with the video. That's okay. We'll try and figure that out okay. for tonight. But uh, okay. <laughs> Jeanette, I will send you a direct link to that so you can uh, see that video and uh, sort of the philosophy that we're going to be following for community economic development. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. And uh, the community economic development piece is a, it's a 0.17% increase in property taxes over uh, last year's budget. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, two other pieces that uh, the Office of the CAO is, is responsible for, human resources is one of them. Uh, there's a modest increase of $5,000 in the HR budget in 2021. Uh, we have some turnover on our um, Occupational Health and Safety Committee and uh, there's required training every year for committee members. So uh, uh, that represents a 0 0.6 increase uh, over taxes from last year. And as uh, Ms. Gray alluded to, in the 2020 budget, uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to get a communications position. Uh, that was in the 2020 budget. Uh, in the 2021 budget, we have moved uh, some things around from other departments uh, to create a new budget uh, for communications. The net uh, effect of that is an $18,500 increase over last year's budget and a few of the things that uh, we are looking at accomplishing in 2021 is uh, enhancements to uh, the district website, which is a foundational piece for our communication strategy. We will be launching new social media sites in 2021, uh, really increasing uh, our community engagement uh, based on the International Association for Public Participation uh, spectrum. Uh, they also uh, all of our print material um, that we uh, use on an annual basis and other advertising. We're going to be doing a monthly mural message uh, and electronic newsletters uh, for uh, sub subscribers to who want to follow um, the district. Uh, connecting more with community partners and certain campaigns like we are soup campaign which uh, you may have seen on twitter now where we're uh, building a stock of uh, of collateral uh, to enhance our uh, communications as we move forward and i believe that that is it for my piece thank you mr mcginnis um so corporate services is comprised of two divisions, legislative services and bylaw services. Legislative services is responsible for services provided to council and committees and most departments within the municipality. Um, responsible for drafting and maintaining bylaws and policies, facilitating municipal elections, records management and freedom of information of the municipality. The overall department budget has seen a small slight rejection this year. As Mr. McKinnis mentioned, the, some of our advertising budget has been put over to the communications department. And um, we have one capital project this year, which is a vault, which is required for our re protection of records. And um, so that is in the budget for $58,500, which will be funded from capital reserves and will not have any net property tax increase. Our bylaw department is responsible for the investigation of bylaw complaints, education of bylaws, and working towards compliance with members of our community. The department is also responsible for business licensing. We have two capital projects under the bylaw department this year, both of which will be funded from the COVID relief fund. The first is an e-bike, uh, in the budget for $3,500. This will allow our officers to have greater access to the trails and like throughout the municipality. And the second one is a new bylaw vehicle, which is in there for $50,000. Uh, this has come um, as a result of the increase in um, requirement for bylaw in our community as well as the COVID restrictions as only one bylaw officer should or one employee should be in a vehicle at a time. 
As these are funded from the COVID relief fund, there will be no net property tax increase resulting from these projects. And that's all I have. Oh, hi everyone. Um, I would like to talk about the uh, finance department budget for 2021. Um, the finance department is, is consistent of uh, financial administration and information system, uh, information technology uh, divisions. To give you a recap, uh, the finance, finance department uh, operating budget is approximately 4% of the total district's uh, 2021 budget, and about 60% of the departmental budget is for financial administration. Um, the uh, division provides a full range of financial management services for the district, um, including accounting, auditing, financial planning, cash management, taxation, payroll, and insurance um, services. The main cost driver for the financial administration um, is the around 5% increase in total salary and benefits. This is due to the divisions finally being fully staffed, um, as well as um, inflation of the benefit costs and annual union contract increases. Some of the improvement we will be making in 2021 um, will be in will be including implementing the electronic payment for all vendors to lower administrative costs and minimize our carbon uh, footprint. We will also be rolling out our new uh, purchasing policy that was adopted last night to the district. Um, as part of the province's centralized homeowners grant initiative, we will be getting ready and transition into a completely new business process to streamline the application and adjudication of homeowners grant. There will be a number of um, grant contingent uh, project as well as the uh, multi multi sports box project underway in 2021. Um, the financial administration division will be supporting um, that project as well as the various internal department and external stakeholder and, and moving those projects forward. We will also be working with the province to uh, identify a potential um, capital project that will be utilizing the 2 million funding received under the COVID restart grant. Um, and as far as the service agreement and uh, community grant goals, we will be continue to provide support for the, the applicants and the recipi recipients under the new policy. Um, and last but not least, uh, we will be supporting the development of a new asset management policy aligned with the council's strate strategic goal. The other division within Finance is information uh, technology, which is accountable for about 40% of total departmental operating <coughs> budget. The division uh, manages a wide, ring, uh, a wide range of computer and technology service for the district. The main cost driver for this division is um, about 1.88% increase of salary and benefit due to con uh, union contract increases. We will also have a number of exciting new IT capital project underway next year. Um, one of them being the SCADA software and hardware up upgrade. The wastewater system will be upgrading to a modern uh, SCADA uh, software platform. Um, this will be um, allow the new SCADA software um, running and, and we'll have the full feature redundancy. Um, the next thing uh, we will be working on is the, the website refresh. Um, Soup.ca will be refreshed and offer a more user-friendly laid out and offer features so that the public can subscribe to updates on community events, council meetings, emergency updates, and all these updates will provide a better foundation uh, for community engagement. Next slide, please. And the uh, 
council chamber uh, on my video will uh, be also be upgraded and uh, this will allow the uh, the streaming of council meeting um, to be uh, more smooth so that the public will be able to have a better experience when streaming the uh, live uh, council events. Last but not least, uh, due to COVID, uh, the need from working from home um, has been increase, increasing uh, and we are upgrading all our infrastructure to allow a more seamless uh, and transparent uh, working from home experience um, for the district. And um, now I will hand it over to Ms. Paolo from Planning and Development. Thank you very much. Uh, with the uh, planning and development department, uh, as mentioned earlier, we are um, tasked with overseeing the planning subdivision and building safety uh, functions for the district. Under the planning branch, uh, typically what we look at is the maintenance and administration of the official community plan, uh, zoning bylaw amendments, which typically uh, are your rezoning of properties, uh, development permits and development variance permit applications, uh, signed permit applications and temporary uh, use permits. Uh, on the subdivision side, uh, this includes the severance of properties as well as uh, works and services agreements and the necessary infrastructure to facilitate those subdivisions. And on the building safety side, administering uh, the BC Building Code and Act. And that's typically uh, when you've gone through most of these processes and coming through for your building permit and uh, ultimate construction and occupancy of those buildings. So on the planning side, we currently have a project that uh, is underway from this year, and that's the official community plan review. And, uh, through that, that will be continuing on into 2021 uh, with an anticipated completion of approximately uh, November, December uh, of next year with uh, the adoption from council. As well, our lot A uh, property, there have been uh, a number of uh, development opportunities that are being explored. Uh, currently, the a uh, library is uh, under construction on that site, as well as uh, uh, a seniors and, and youth center uh, that's being uh, looked at in the northeast quadrant. And then the remaining uh, properties on that site, uh, staff are actively working with potential uh, developers on proposals that might fit within that vision that was completed through a charrette process. Uh, as well, the development contribution uh, reserve policies, this is something that uh, it can be applicable at the time of going through development and they might be related to things such as affordable housing contributions, whether that's through uh, units that are being provided for affordable housing or a cash contribution, but those become applicable and something that uh, staff will be working towards in the new year to ensure that they align with what council's goals for development are. And lastly, with uh, changes uh, through the uh, Agricultural Land Commission uh, exclusion properties, we'll be looking at policies as well for that. Uh, on the subdivision side, uh, budget-wise, we'll be looking at uh, adding a new position based from non-market uh, growth to fund that position, as well as the continuation of a approving officer contract uh, of approximately $70,000, which would represent a 0.81% property tax increase. Uh, lastly, from building safety side, uh, we'll be looking forward to the adoption of the new building bylaw as well as continuous uh, training for our building officials to maintain the necessary certifications and ultimately uh, application of the provincially mandated step code that'll be coming through. Um, uh, Ms. Gray, would it be possible to see if that uh, link is accessible uh, just below the picture souk for the, uh, the review of the OCP? Something hopefully should be coming up. Uh, yeah, it's visible there. So this is just our main page uh, for the OCP review. So this is where a lot of uh, what planning and development is currently working on throughout uh, the course of the next year for engagement. And we encourage uh, members of the public to visit the site uh, frequently just to get more up to date information, as well as uh, as you scroll down, there's a list of meeting dates that our advisory committee who is uh, representing different sectors of the public uh, and, and business industries. Uh, to provide input on this process. Uh, you can follow through with the minutes or attend uh, these public meetings just to view and, and see what uh, discussions are occurring. But th this is a great site for uh, getting up-to-date information on the OCP review 
and uh, following through and, and contacting staff is always an option as well to get uh, further information. Uh, with that, that concludes my uh, portion of the presentation. Thanks, Mr. Paolo. Uh, my name is Jeff Carter and I hold the responsibility for operations director in SUC. Uh, for the operations department, our responsibilities uh, include the engineering department, uh, geographical information services uh, department, which involves all our mapping, as well as uh, parks and environmental service and the wastewater department. I'm gonna go through the next few slides here. Uh, just to go over some of the key functions our, of our departments, as well as uh, provide some highlights into the sort of 2021 capital projects that we're looking to bring forward for council consideration in the budget process this year. Um, so to start off, we got the engineering department, our key responsibilities there. Uh, we support development design review, as well as the construction acceptance of uh, a lot of the subdivisions and developments going on in town. We also provide design coordination, uh, planning and the implementation of all the capital projects associated with the infrastructure being built in Souk. And we manage the Public Works uh, road maintenance contract, which Ms. Gray has highlighted earlier in this presentation. Uh, in conjunction with that, we deal with uh, a lot of the calls for service and uh, try and deal with a lot of public inquiries and get responses out in a timely manner. Um, we're really excited this year in uh, 2021. Council has just adopted our transportation as well as our parks and trail master plan. Uh, and with that, we've brought forward uh, the number one project here is for capital construction of uh, engagement in the Church Road corridor, which is going to be inclusive of uh, roundabout construction at Church and Throop, as well as uh, intersection upgrades to facilitate uh, additional traffic loads, as well as active transportation at the intersection of Church and Highway 14. Some of the other smaller projects that I'll highlight on, uh, we got money requested for budget to investigate uh, design and potential repairs uh, for the end of Murray Road. We got EV charger uh, project uh, slated to go in on Eustace and we have money annually sort of uh, put aside for transit repair maintenance and uh, upgrades to those stations. Um, we have a five year road maintenance program, road paving program. Now, typically this has been a $700,000 a year program. We've cut it back a little bit this year just to facilitate the construction of some of our other capital projects and to proactively put the planning of the paving in, in areas where we won't be typically coming back to dig up or resurface areas uh, causing rework for the district. So we've stretched this out a little bit over the next few years and cut it back to $300,000 a year. Uh, priority focus on that will be in the Church Road area in conjunction with our uh, major capital project to improve that corridor. Another significant project uh, as it relates to development as well as impacts on Highway 14, we'll be looking at upgrades uh, to the charters as well as Drennan intersections. And we are working on uh, servicing, uh, providing hydro service for the district lot uh, that uh, Ms. Gray has highlighted earlier in the presentation. That sums it up for our engineering department capital project construction. Uh, now I'm going to get into the design projects that we're bringing forward for 2021 as they relate to the adopted transportation master plan uh, that council has adopted earlier this fall. So as I've highlighted earlier, we're looking at engagement of the center project on the map you see in front of you, uh, which will include the Church Road roundabout as well as upgrades to the intersection. And we are looking at bringing forward uh, the majority of the design projects as they relate to the transportation master plan. So we're, we're going to be bringing forward for council consideration to engage in improvements to the Phillips Road uh, streetscape, which will include uh, sort of existing sidewalks and facilitate uh, active transportation and widening the corridor a little bit as well as the connector that's going to take Throop Road all the way or Phillips Road and Throop Road and connect the two of them just highlighted in uh, purple color there in front of you on your screen. We're also going to design uh, for Charters Corridor as well as like I've indicated the Church Road Corridor 
We've completed final design uh, and just going through the last details on the final design for the Otter Point corridor. And we're looking at potential uh, preliminary designs for realignment of Grant Road West as well as upgrades to the Otter Point corridor. Our hopes with these projects is to get as much design as we can, can get completed uh, for these transportation projects. They are significant projects. Um, they will facilitate active transportation and they are gonna relieve pressure off Highway 14. Our goal with this is to have these projects shelf ready so that we can uh, aggressively attack grant applications uh, that would be in line with these projects and overall reduce the cost to the taxpayers to implement uh, projects of this magnitude. The next slide, Ms. Gray. Um, this is an overall summary just of our uh, engineering department budget and capital project asks. Uh, Ms. Gray has highlighted this earlier in the presentation. We have total budget requested uh, for capital project in additions uh, in the engineering department for approximately $3.8 million. Uh, majority of this funding is going to be through grants and reserve funds uh, with the $70,000 portion of it uh, requested to be funded through taxation, which represents a 0.8% tax increase. Next slide. Uh, thanks, Ms. Gray. So second department under operations will be the GIS department. Key functions in this department, uh, they work hand in hand with finance incorporating annual property tax assessments into our system. Uh, they work on annual reporting on all the capital tangible assets and they manage all the integrated asset management software and are responsible for all the data input into that software so we can achieve uh, effective asset management sort of programming and planning throughout the district. Um, they also deal with several internal support and referral requests from uh, all departments within the district of Souk. There's going to be a 0% uh, budget requests uh, increase for this department this year and some of the key highlights that they're going to be working on operationally will be and include software upgrades to public uh, mapping interface on our website, which will include new features that will enhance land information and search tools for the public. We're going to be flying uh, and taking updated aerial imagery photographs this summer, and we anticipate they will be integrated into our GIS database uh, near the end of 2021. Um, this department will also be focusing on uh, rolling out an asset management policy and a comprehensive strategy for council's consideration. Next slide. Uh, so operations for the sewer department. Um, so we've been strategically sort of approaching and uh, approaching a good strategy here uh, to address uh, capacities within our system. Our, our system is, is getting close to capacities, uh, far from it at this point, but we want to be really proactive in addressing this. And as Ms. Gray has highlighted, we are actively uh, waiting for a response on a substantial grant application that would include doubling the footprint of our wastewater plant and addressing a couple key other areas within our collection system uh, that would substantially take care of uh, any capacity concerns that were present. Um, hopefully if successful with this grant we would be going into the planning and design stages next year and hopefully rolling out the project within the next two to three years. Uh, key functions for our staff, uh, they typically will operate and maintain the treatment facility, all the collection system, which will include all the pump stations, uh, generators, as well as all the pipe networks and manholes. Uh, they'll do regular maintenance on all this infrastructure. They deal with all the testing and regulatory compliance uh, that requirements down at the wastewater treatment plant, and they'll be responsible for implementing and planning all our capital projects as it relates to wastewater, as well as dealing with calls for service and public inquiries. Um, some 2021 project highlights that we're bringing forward for budget consideration will be the master plan development uh, for our sewer system. Now, this is a very uh, strategic plan, and it will be put forward in a staged approach. Typically, we're going to run series of model analysis that will sort of project maximum build out scenarios within our community so we can proactively stay ahead of development and plan our capital projects accordingly so that we can meet the capacity needs of uh, the district of Souk. 
Um, as I've indicated, the grant application that's underway will uh, take care of uh, two capacity concerns within our system, and we are bringing forward uh, another improvement on West Coast Road for a gravity sewer main. Um, and essentially with these three projects, uh, our sewer system will be in really healthy shape. So we're hoping to go forward with the design of that project this year, as well as investigating some odor control mitigation strategies and uh, addressing some strategic inflow and infiltration projects that will address uh, infiltration that's coming into our, in, into our system. And it's essentially gonna uh, eliminate and uh, relieve a little bit of the capacity constraints within our collection system. Further aspects of the master plan, uh, once we do the projected modeling analysis uh, to determine sort of areas of capacities and uh, proactively sort of plan our capital projects, we're gonna be looking at doing feasibility studies in two key areas uh, with WIF and SPIT, as well as the Caltassin area. These feasibility studies are essentially gonna roll out class D estimates and be able to give us a good sense of uh, what the cost and how feasible it will be to look at options for bringing on uh, additional areas in, into our collection system and being able to go forward with uh, consideration for bringing those areas on within the next uh, three to five years. But uh, it, it's not set in stone. We have to first go through the feasibility analysis that will give us the results to bring forward for council consideration. Um, overall, there'll be a zero tax increase uh, in the wastewater department as all the funds are funded through the existing parcel tax. And that concludes my presentation uh, for the three areas of operations. I'll pass it over to Ms. Hooper, who's gonna take you through uh, some of the exciting stuff we're bringing forward for uh, Parks and Environmental Service Department. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Carter. Uh, uh, Parks and Environmental Services has, has, has a few key functions. Key functions. We're, we're distinctly divided, divided into. into. Does anybody else hear that feedback or is it just me? No, there is a lot of feedback. Let me try again. Oh, that's better. Whoever muted made it better. Sorry, I'll start again. Parks and Environmental Services has uh, two distinct key functions. One is parks operations, where our staff take care of the day-to-day -day maintenance of our public assets or green space assets, which include about 100 um, parks spaces and nearly 20 kilometers of trail system. We also, through the parks operations, are responsible for the seasonal adornments, so the Christmas lights, the banners that you see change seasonally, but also community cleanups where we work with volunteer groups to do cleanups of our local park systems or beaches. The environmental services portion of the department takes care of the development and design review and construction acceptance of parks related development. That's where developers would design and implement park construction on our, our behalf. We also work to design and coordinate capital project impl implementation, which is something I'll speak to in a moment about the budgets. We also deal with a great number of calls for service and public inquiries related to parks and the environment. Another key function of both departments is dealing with hazardous trees and vegetation. We currently see a great number of calls for service coming from hazardous tree requests, but also dealing with noxious weeds such um, as tansy ragwort and Japanese knotweed, which are new emerging nasties that are coming into our parks and environment. Ms. Gray, would you kindly forward the slide? Thanks. Parks and Environmental Services, as you heard from Ms. Gray, is a good portion of the district's budgets, but these are the forward-facing projects that the community sees. It's our forward face, really. The COVID Relief Fund will provide us with additional parks department equipment, um, which is an additional truck for us, so that our parks laborers can work more safely and not have to, on the most part, share a truck. It also allows us for additional money for parks laborers so that we can increase our cleaning of our public assets such as our water fountains, bathrooms, etc., but also to compensate for the increase in the number of parkland dedications that we're seeing over time as a result of development. 
The exciting projects that Mr. Carter alluded to are listed next. And these four projects will be paid for if we're successful in acquiring grants through the grant application and not tax increases. The first project is the Little River Pedestrian Crossing, previously known as the Demand Mule Creek Pedestrian Crossing. And this is phase two of that project that will be paid for um, through the grant and through other sources over the next three years. That connection is connecting the Poye and Journey Middle School to the Sun River and Phillips Road community um, and will be part of the Sun Run Trail system. The next exciting project is the multi-sport court box, which has been successful in acquiring grants in 2020, and construction is expected to start in May or June after we receive a development permit from the District of Souk. That sport box will be constructed um, just past Sun River Way in on Phillips Road in Sun River Estates. The third project is the Bluff Staircase, which will be reconstructed and made larger in response sorry, larger meaning wider, in response to COVID-19. We do have a need to replace this structure due to um, rot and degradation of the structure, but we seize the opportunity to apply for a grant to make that staircase wider and more resistant to the elements in response to seeing that the community does need outdoor recreation during COVID-19. It was one of those structures that was closed in response to inability to have social distancing in the spring, and we felt that this was a appropriate project. The fourth project is the Soup Potholes. Um, this property was recently acquired in April of 2020, and it needs a, a few upgrades to make it COVID friendly, but also to put the polish on a iconic district of Souk Park, which is known internationally. And I'll quickly finish up with the other non-tax sources, um, the development of a dog park through the John Phillips Park and Ponds Park corridor system, the development of solid waste management strategy, focusing on yard waste deposit or yard waste drop off, large item recycling and toxic roundup. The third one is boardwalk repairs, and this is in response to some some erosion that is happening at the boardwalk where it meets the accessible walkway. And that's a way to make sure that we're saving that asset and not letting it get too damaged. A town center parks plan in response to the need for a town center park as outlined in the Parks and Trails Master Plan of 2020. And we expect that that will be focused on lot A. Park asset repairs, just the routine repairs of capital repairs of small bridges and trails and other items such as playgrounds that need ongoing maintenance and then the final thirty thousand dollars for parks equipment and that's to cover off the wear and tear of our small machinery and sometimes our large machinery such as trucks as they have a limited lifespan in the parks world i'll now hand it off to the next presenter thank you ms gray Thank you, Laura. Uh, the Department of Community Safety is um, comprised of about 74 people. It has two functions, the fire department and the emergency program. The fire department is a combination fire department that includes eight full-time career staff, two chief officers, two captains, three fighter fighters with, with one of them on a flex schedule and one administrative assistant. The operations are complemented by 29 paid on call suppression support firefighters and then we have six uh, non-suppression team members and in addition in the last year and a half a uh, you know well-respected volunteer mechanic we respond on a five-year average to about 963 calls and these calls comprise fires of all types whether they're wildfires um, structure fires vehicle fires and we also deal with many motor vehicle incidents and rescue, land-based rescue, high-angle rope rescue. Several complaints and hazardous conditions of all types, and we respond to medical calls that are in the emergency health services, orange, red, and purple. That's your Charlie, Delta, and Echo type of calls. We also handle many commercial alarms and residential alarms and CO detector alarms, and every now and then we're responding to unique public service calls such as flooding and animal rescues. 
The emergency program is consisting of a emergency program coordinator and district staff that support the emergency operations center. The emergency support services team is volunteer based of about 25 members and includes one of those members being the director of emergency support services. We also have a neighborhood emergency preparedness program and then four HEM operator, uh, operators that are dealing with our Sioux emergency radio group. Next slide, please. Some of the key items that we have for 2021 budget is really uh, looking at um, retention strategies. We have uh, increased the relief worker line item from 18,000 to 61,000, and this is really returning to an actual level since we did not uh, bring in another firefighter in 2020. As far as retention goes, uh, the highest the fire department has ever been at with an aggregate of career and volunteer members is back in 2006, 2007 was 53. Right now, we're currently at about 36 members right now. And similar to the RCMP data for future considerations, the Department of Community Safety is looking at how we should be dealing with uh, um, the proper membership as the community grows. The graphics here are kind of showing a, a study that was done by the National Fire Protection Association. And this is data from 2014 to 2016. And as far as Canadian averages uh, go, you know, with a population of 15,000 people, the current uh, ratio in Canada is about 52, and we're at uh, 29. In the last uh, year, we've had about 10 members leave due to a number of reasons from work, um, retirement, school, leaving the community, etc. On the career side, that ratio there is um, average in Canada at 11, and we're currently at seven. So there's a declining trend as far as um, you know membership numbers go internationally, and uh, we're actually uh, low in comparison to Canadian standards there. As far as health and uh, wellness goes, we're investing in increasing our health and wellness budget to $10,000. This will include support for our performance of fitness initiatives, additional cancer screening and cardiology testing work. Also, we'll be looking at any type of, of COVID restart eligible expenses to help with the health and wellness there. As far as recruitment goes, um, we did not have a recruitment class in 2020 and we expect a late start in 2021, further focusing on our retention uh, budget uh, implications and that being a strategy for us. And we'll be looking at all benefits of eligible expenses with the uh, Restart BC grant. Next slide, please. In the 2021 budget, over two years, we have $20,000 towards a master plan. Fire departments at a key part here where there's several impacts uh, that we need to look at uh, for the long term. This includes the proper type of staffing in the future, um, how our actual implementation of the paid on call has had successes with recruitment and what it means with retention. Can we achieve and what is necessary to get to a 10 minute response time to support the, the business and building community? Improvements to our public fire protection classification rating through the fire underwriters survey and what it means if we have the right staffing in place with the proper fire prevention and public education program and constant review of long term apparatus replacement plans to lessen the impact on uh, taxation and borrowing of money. Station uh, one, there's uh, we're kind of in the middle of a, uh, a remodeling stage that uh, was part of the Rick Hansen Foundation grant. Uh, we put a lot of things on pause this year, obviously, as far as continuing on with the proper kind of layout in station one. But we do have some critical things that need to look at deferred maintenance, uh, the sprinkler system being in proper compliance, and um, also making sure that uh, we have proper security in place also. We are looking at current design modifications and we're expecting quotation to support um, us for 2021 budget that's still forthcoming. I'll move it on to the next slide, which will be uh, to our staff sergeant. Good morning, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just wanted to share how proud we are to be serving serving the community and a supportive community at that. Um, part two of that, though, is it's also the second fastest growing community in the CRD, so that certainly uh, causes a few challenges for us. I just wanted to go over just a bit of a recap of the hybrid model of policing that we provide here. And when I say hybrid, that's just referring to the fact that we're funded by different sources and we have different areas of responsibility. 
So right now we are uh, providing policing services to the District of Souk, as well as all the outlying communities of East Souk, Otter Point, Shirley, Jordan River, and Port Renfrew. We currently consist of 17 RCMP officers. 13 of those are funded by the District of Souk and four are funded by the province. In addition to that, we have some support staff. We have uh, four administrative support staff, one victim service worker, and four part-time on-call guards. Um, we provide a response to all calls for service, ranging from um, provincial statutes, traffic accidents, and up to and including very serious criminal offenses. Um, time permitting, it's always a focus of our detachment to be as proactive and as visible as we can in the community through uh, both through enforcement and community, community policing initiatives and being active in the schools and everywhere else that we can be. We can move on to the next slide there. Uh, a little bit of a, a busy slide here, but um, it's really just sort of painting the picture of, of where we're at and where the community is going and uh, some, some thought that has to be put into your policing services keeping up to the growth of your community. Right now we have a ratio of policemen to popula uh, population of 1 to 1100. The provincial average for communities under 15,000 is 1 to 744, so there's certainly a bit of a gap there. In order for us to maintain the status quo of what we have, which is already a, a bit behind the curve, uh, we need to be planning to be at uh, 16.4 in the year 2028. If we're to focus on maintaining one per 1,000, um, we should already be at uh, over 14 and working towards 18 members in 2028. And uh, if we were to work towards the provincial average for communities of our size, we should already be at 19.3, uh, so six more than we've got, and working towards 24 towards 2028. Um, discussions are underway and there's certainly been some support to, for um, consideration of adding a new member to our detachment in the year 2022, which we're uh, greatly appreciative of. Um, however, I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, I look forward to working with the district for, for a long-term plan, just to make sure that we're not falling behind. When I talked about how the detachment is split between provincial policing and municipal policing, it's always very important to me to make sure that uh, the right, the, the, that the proper areas are getting their share. So right now our split is 76%. So 76% of our, our membership is paid for by the District of Souk. And if we go back over the last three years, uh, 2018, 77% of the calls were Souk calls. 78% in 2019 and this year uh, guesstimating because uh, the end of the year is not quite here yet. We're looking at coming in at about 75%. So we're all right on the money there. Um, next slide, please. One other uh, piece of information I wanted to bring forward. Um, we participate with the other CRD police policing agencies in the funding of some integrated units. The ones that we fund directly through the detachment is the Integrated Mobile Christ Response Team, which is a, a team of a team of policemen and, and healthcare professionals that assist us with mental health calls. We also participate in the Mobile Youth Service Team, which uh, focuses on youth at risk. A lot of our youth at risk end up in downtown Victoria, so it's very advantageous for us to have the services of that unit that will reach out and assist us on dealing with some of those individuals. The Regional Domestic Violence Unit, which assists us in the um, most serious domestic violence files. They'll, they work with people right through the entire court process. It's, uh, it consists of uh, Ministry of Children and Family Development and all the different partners involved to provide all the support to victims that we can to get the best resolution to, to bad situations. Crime Stoppers, um, which uh, yeah, there's an awful lot of information for us as well as the Greater Victoria Police Advisory Committee. So needless to say, these units do support our service delivery in the community and outside on our behalf. In the past, portions of these services budgets have been included in the District of Souks budgeting, but recently they've been paid out of the detachment's operating budget. I believe the reason that happened was that the money was being set aside, but if we do not run full, as in have all our positions clear for the year, we don't necessarily need it because it's it's covered by some slippage within. Um, but what I'm asking for is that the 
the district revisit um, keeping that as a line item. I'm just concerned that we're going to get to a year where I'm fortunate enough to keep the detachment fully staffed and uh, these these charges are going to result in um, in not meeting our budget expectations. So um, and that is it for my brief presentation. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you to everyone for participating and for providing some information to the community and our one uh, resident who is attending this session on the 20, the inputs to the 2021 um, to 2025 five-year financial plan. So I, I was just going to wrap it up with providing a general overview of next steps, uh, which would be we uh, have this open house presentation uh, this morning, as well as we have an evening session from 6.30 to 8 p.m. tonight. And uh, staff will um, consolidate the results of these sessions and provide the information to council at the uh, next budget meeting, which is Monday, December 14th. And looking to hopefully um, have council to support to receive third reading on the uh, 2021 to 2025 five-year financial plan. And if that is received, then the next step on that would uh, on the in the process would be to have the formal budget adopted at the January 11th uh, council meeting. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I will just um, maybe highlight some. Q and A, and let me bear with me for one second as I try to stop sharing my screen. Um, hopefully, we're back just to the regular team session. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight. I'm not sure if Miss Wilford is still on uh, the session, but I believe you had submitted a couple of questions. Um, one of them was finance related, so I'll touch on that one. And then um, just maybe if you're still on the call, if you want to confirm if you have uh, further questions that perhaps uh, one of the departments can answer for you. So I know that the finance related question was around um, the transparency and posting um, publicly budget to actual comparisons. So that's definitely a project that the district will be undertaking in 2021 is to work with our new communications position as well as uh, the uh, CAO and council to um, come up with um, more better ways to um, present this information to the public um, in a more clear and transparent manner because uh, you know that definitely can be a challenge of how to present the information. And there's a difference between the way the information has to be presented on our financial statements versus how it's presented in uh, the annual budget, our five-year financial plan that, that staff and, uh, sorry, the community see. So once we um, come up with uh, a new version and of how to share that information for the public, uh, we will definitely be um, working on promoting that and sending that out uh, out that communication to the greater community as a whole. Um, apparently I'm cutting out a bit, but I will uh, leave that there. Perhaps Ms. Wilford, I don't know if you have other questions that you would like um, staff to answer at this time. Ms. Wilford, did you have any questions of staff? Remember, you'll need to unmute your microphone. Sorry, I was having problems unmuting my phone as usual. Um, no, no other questions. I think it's been an excellent presentation. I wish we had more people from the public uh, attending, but uh, we really need to, uh, I guess, get the word out more. There's not that many people on Twitter. Um, and that's where I found this information. That's where I found this information. Sorry, Ms. Wilford, uh, are you able to repeat that? The first part of your statement was a little bit muffled, but it became clear right at the very end. So I'm not sure if you had your microphone in a different position.
I believe what I heard was just that um, that Ms. Wilford thought that we needed to get the information out um, in a more consistent manner and that I'm not sure where she found the information, but she did identify that, but I'm not sure if anybody else was able to determine that, but I think you can go ahead, Ms. Gray. Okay, thank you. Um, so we did receive a few questions um, uh, through uh, social media. We are able to source out some questions, so perhaps I will just at a high level um, touch on a couple of them and uh, just request that each department director can provide perhaps just a, 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 a bit more information on some of these questions. Um, so I'll probably just go in the order of department. So uh, the first department was uh, there was a question around economic development um, and it is what is the district doing to support plans to develop our local economy? So perhaps Mr. McKinnis can just elaborate on that a little bit. I know you touched on it in your presentation um, and perhaps just provide a couple more um, bits of information on economic development. Sure, it's uh, certainly a priority in Council's strategic plan and accordingly. Uh, on Monday, December 14th, there will be a report going to Council to constitute uh, the membership of a new Community Economic Development Committee. Um, that committee will then work towards a, uh, a work plan based on the tenets of sustainable development. So triple bottom line, it, uh, the focus will be on the economy, the environment and social issues in order to uh, increase wellness in our community. Um, also, as I alluded to earlier in the 2020 uh, draft budget right now, which has received two readings and will go for third reading on December 14th, uh, there is a new position for our community economic development coordinator um, who will, our community development uh, officer who will work uh, with the CAO and certainly work with our community economic development um, committee to identify uh, the most important things. We've had a small working group um, that's been working together since June, uh, basically uh, relationship building, uh, but keeping on top of uh, COVID and uh, looking at recovery strategies for COVID. Um, but the recovery portion is not here yet. Uh, we're still in the middle of this. And uh, um, so the Chamber of Commerce is uh, there. WorkLink uh, Society is at the table. Um, Tourism Association is at the table. Uh, so uh, our Souk Region Health Network is at the table as well. So we've got all the right play players at the table. Uh, we have done a document review of a number of uh, community economic development strategies uh, that have been done over the year, the years, and uh, we pulled out the top five issues from those reports. Um, but I think ultimately uh, what will be the, um, the ultimate top priorities will uh, certainly have a COVID lens, at least in the short term. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mr. McInnes. Uh, the next question is relating to uh, bylaw that hopefully Ms. Machado can answer. Um, it, it's in regards to how many bylaw complaints are received and tickets issued each year and is ticketing a revenue stream for the district? Uh, thank you, Ms. Gray. Um, the district receives an average of 450 bylaw complaints annually, but did see an increase to 512 complaints in 2019. This resulted in an issuance of 84 tickets. Most of the tickets issued are warning tickets and the ticket revenue is not a revenue stream for the, the municipality. Uh, the collection of revenue for tickets in 2020, sorry, I just need to, was uh, $600 uh, thus far but in 2019 was only $150. So bylaw officers really do work towards compliance with um, our community. Uh, thank you, Ms. Machada. Uh, there's a couple finance questions that I will address here. Um, and it's, it's saying there's a need for a lot of big items in souk with roads and sewers in particular. What revenue streams apart from property taxes are available to fund these projects? Uh, so some revenue streams that, that the district is definitely looking at 
would be uh, we have uh, reserve funds um, specifically for certain projects. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, there's a development cost charge um, reserves for roads and wastewater projects that can only be used for, for projects indicated in those bylaws, uh, as well as there's grant uh, funding that the district is pursuing um, wholeheartedly into 2021 to fund some of these projects. Um, and as well as uh, potentially if we if we did need to enter into debt, in theory, the debt payments would then have to be funded with property taxes, but at least the initial outlay of the cost of the project could be funded over a longer period of time. So there wouldn't be an immediate hit to uh, property taxes in any one year. Um, and the other question was just in regards to, uh, Souk's at a bit of a crossroads where the community is growing, but our road system is behind. It seems like it's going to cost a lot to catch up. How will increased costs be managed? And is there a rolling 10 year or five year plan adjusted each year? Uh, and, and so the, um, I'm sure Mr. Carter could talk about this more um, in a couple of the follow-up questions here, but uh, as far as there, there's every year we enter into a five-year financial plan process. And so through that process, all capital projects are looked into and adjusted um, if necessary. Uh, as the community should see in 2025, there's significant uh, funding and uh, debt being entered into potentially and grant applications for a significant portion of the roads projects being uh, endorsed by council in the transportation master plan. And um, as far as costs being managed, uh, you know, that's always the something the staff and, uh, and council is aware of and cognizant of every year when we go through the annual financial plan process. and. Um, any avenue to help reduce the taxpayer cost is definitely explored and pursued on that. Um, the next couple questions were under the Development Services Department, so hopefully Mr. Paolo could, could maybe speak to that. And it's just in regards to um, developer contributions um, with uh, development in Souk, um, and, as far, and questions about adequate parking, and if there's any updates on uh, Mariner's Village. Certainly, thanks, uh, Ms. Gray. So in terms of uh, developer contributions, uh, developers are generally required to pay for um, certain works that are required as part of their proposed developments. So the on-site works uh, such as stormwater management and landscaping, uh, we take a landscaping um, security as well for, for certain things as part of the landscaping plan, uh, along with uh, frontage improvements if they're applicable. So that would be things like street trees and sidewalks, and then uh, anything that might be applicable as part of the development cost charges. So um, payments for sewer, water, roads, parks, uh, things of that nature. So uh, anything that would be in addition to those would be uh, contributions that would be imposed by the district as part of a policy. Uh, so something that uh, could be a, applicable on a covenant registered against the title would be uh, contributions for affordable housing. So specific payments that are required at the time of uh, rezoning that uh, this uh, requirement was put on of the developer. And that could be for providing a certain number of affordable units or cash in lieu, uh, as well as amenities might be provided as well. So there, there's a certain number of contributions that are all kind of case by case, depending on what the proposal uh, is putting forward. Uh, for the parking question that was uh, specific to the town core area, uh, the zoning bylaw indicates what our minimum parking requirements are depending uh, on the specific use that's being proposed. So each one has a certain calculation of the number of uh, parking stalls that might be required. Uh, specifically within the town core area, uh, parking standards can be reduced by 50%. And that's in order to maximize developable land base and encourage uh, active transportation as a means to get around the town core. So really uh, limiting the amount of congestion that we would have by having more people walking and biking throughout the town core area and, and uh, leaving uh, leaving the vehicles out. Uh, if there were to be consideration to have more parking uh, within the town core area, uh, something like a parking facility could potentially be uh, an option to accommodate that or uh, a developer doesn't take uh, advantage of the 50% reduction and just provides the, 
uh, the amounts that they feel necessary to accommodate their development. And lastly, on the Mariners Village question, well, we do get that one uh, quite often because it is uh, is visible within the community. And uh, we, we continue to receive requests for information and as common with any uh, major vacant properties within the district and specifically within the town core area that are for sale. Uh, we'll get requests to review specific proposals and to see how they might align with uh, any of our policies and, and bylaws. And at that point, it's left with any prospective uh, developers to proceed with an application process. And then at that time, the public would be made aware of what might be proceeding on specific parts of property. So Mariners would also fall into that category as well. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mr. Pello. Um, there's just a couple shorter questions here for um, Chief Mount. Uh, one of the questions was how many calls for service do our fire personnel attend to, which I believe you addressed, and what type of calls do they attend? Um, I'll just circle back with you if there's anything further you wanted to add to that. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. I can probably expand a little bit more on the types of uh, emergency calls we deal with. So. Um, when I talk about fires of all type, that goes into a little more detail. That will be uh, structure fires, chimney fires, appliance fires, vehicle fires, wildland fires, rubbish fires, beach fire, controlled fire, uh, spill that's uh, ensuing a fire explosion, and uh, bark mulch fires are quite typical. In the rescue side of incidents, we deal with the medical calls I explained, rope rescue technical calls, um, jaws of life incidents, water rescue, confined space rescue, uh, crane rescue, elevator rescues, and trail type rescues with the our all terrain vehicle. And hazardous conditions can involve any type of uh, spilled explosives, power lines down, arcing electrical issues, chemical emergencies, or a tree down. And the public service calls, uh, someone could be locked in a vehicle assisting RCMP, smoke or odor removal, animal rescue, investigations, flooding issues, uh, assisting public works. And then we have several types of alarm calls. Some involve no fire, some are false, and it can be a smoke sighting, a sprinkler surge issue, dis discharge, detector activated, um, exhaust gas cloud uh, mistaken for smoke, a CO2 alarm, and uh, we can have a malicious, mischievous false alarm pull, accidental alarm system malfunction or intrusion type of alarm. And then on the non-emergency side, uh, we tend to deal with 150 plus kind of walk-in uh, related non-emergency calls that uh, can encompass anything, you know, from doing a unique uh, inspection, um, you know, requesting information, things like that. Great. Uh, thank you, Chief Mount. And uh, there was a, a question for uh, the star Staff Sergeant uh, Sindin. Uh, which I believe you addressed, but similar, I will just let you uh, speak to it uh, further if there's anything else you wanted to add. Um, it, they just stated, I think I heard police levels try to keep to a one officer to 1,000 residents ratio. Where are we at now? And how is policing funded? Um, so I'll maybe just briefly touch on the funding piece um, before I turn it over to, to uh, Staff Sergeant Sinton if he wanted to add anything further. So as far as the funding goes, as was stated, um, currently the district, because where our population is under 15,000, we are responsible for 70% of the policing costs. Uh, as soon as the population uh, exceeds 15,000, which is anticipated to happen uh, when the next uh, census is completed in 2022, uh, we will be, the district will be responsible for 90% of the policing costs. And so in order to account for that, there has been a um, future policing cost reserve fund established uh, a few years ago. And so that fund um, currently has a balance of $422,000 uh, in it. And that fund will be used over the next few years after um, to help offset some of the costs of the 90% uh, 70% to 90% uh, funding required by the district. Um, Mr. Sindin, Staff Sergeant Sindin, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, the only other piece was the one to 1,000 and I did cover that. We're at one to 1,100 right now. Well, actually 2019, we're at one to 1,100. Perfect. Can I just Thank make you. a clarification on that though? For sure. Um, Staff Sergeant Sindin, when I do the math uh, on your numbers that are on uh, slide 26 of the presentation today, 
uh, at the one per 1,000 and even at the provincial average uh, of 19.3, if we do the math at 70% cost, uh, the municipality is responsible for 13 members, which we're at. So it would seem that it is the province that is short members. Can you comment on that? Our our provincial population is about, uh, I just checked, is about 5,100, I believe. I'm just going off the top of my head. So we, we end up being pretty close to, I mean, that 76-24 split, just call volume and population is pretty close. Certainly we're behind on the provincial side as well, um, but we're behind on both sides. Okay, great, uh, thank you. And just a couple more uh, questions. I'll start maybe with uh, Ms. Hooper and the Parks Department. And there was a statement, no question, just a huge thank you to the great work done at Whiff and Spit after the recent storm. I was not expecting such a significant cleanup and appreciate the efforts that were put into maintaining this space. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I think that's great. As, as Ms. Hooper stated, the parks are what the community really sees out there. So uh, if things aren't happening, the community will see it. And it's nice to get some acknowledgement when um, the community seeing that we're actually out there trying to make this, uh, the district a clean and accessible and safe place for the residents to enjoy. Uh, the one quick question was uh, the status of the dog park in Souk. So perhaps Ms. Hooper can just uh, provide a quick update on that. Uh, thank you, Ms. Gray. The project is slated to begin in January of 2021. It is a council strategic priority and uh, staff is just balancing out other strategic priorities before tackling this one. So we expect that we will start um, communicating with the community association in early January and come up with a plan as per council's direction, attaching some budgets um, to ensure that we can construct a, a dog park in the appropriate location uh, and within budget. We hope that the community association or expect that the community association is going to be providing some in-kind support and um, the community should be looking forward to some communication with council in early January of 2020. 2021, sorry. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hooper. So uh, just in the interest of time, we're almost at 11 o'clock here, so I'll just um, perhaps turn it over to Mr. Carter for the last couple of questions. Uh, one was just around the sewers, which I believe you touched on. Um, what uh, we've been told for 15 years that we were required to connect to sewer, but that the existing plant is nearing capacity. Um, what's being done to increase the capacity on the system? What are the next phases for additional residents to connect? So I believe uh, Mr. Carter discussed that and I mentioned this as well, is that we will be, um, ex we've applied for a provincial federal grant to expand the sewer, so uh, which will provide additional uh, capacity at the plant. Um, so once we hear about that, we can provide further information to the community um, on what uh, that will mean. Um, and then a couple of the sidewalk and roads questions were, um, what are the plans for side? I, I believe these have been touched on, but I'll just let Mr. Carter have a minute or two to add anything further. What are the plans for sidewalk infrastructure? Um, what's next in developing trails to support active transportation, which I believe Ms. Hooper touched upon? And um, what is being done to manage traffic from Cicinos to the town core? Do you have anything to add to those, Mr. Carter? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ms. Gray. No, you, you've covered everything uh, pretty substantially there. Um, so yeah, in alignment with applying for uh, a substantial grant to increase our capacities at the wastewater plant, we're also proactively looking at uh, going into design on a couple other projects. Um, in alignment with that, we're going to be rolling out a master plan for council consideration, which is going to allow us to make some more well-informed decisions around additional capacities uh, into our collection system. In terms of the sidewalks, um, what I didn't indicate is the ministry is uh, working towards completion of upwards of million and a half dollars worth of sidewalk improvements on West Coast Road from Otter Point all the way down to McGregor Park. And as I've already highlighted, uh, we are working towards uh, final designs in on Otter Point Road corridor, which will include sidewalks 
as well as sidewalks will be included as well as active transportation in the entire corridor um, that's in the five year financial plan primarily for design next year that's going to look at connecting Phillips Road all the way through Throop and the realignment of Grant Road West. Um, ultimately, I think that addresses all of the questions uh, in terms of active transportation trail networks. Uh, Ms. Hooper has alluded to that uh, we're working towards uh, hearing from our grant partners to see if we're successful in an application to commute or complete the Little River pedestrian crossing, which will essentially uh, link Sun Rivers uh, to our town core and in conjunction with the transportation network connection um, that would ultimately take uh, pressure off of Highway 14, uh, eliminating the need for most daily commuters from Sun Rivers to uh, go through the town core in morning runs to school as well as uh, commuting into town if needed for work. So. I believe that's it, and I think that addresses most of the questions, unless there was uh, anything else anyone had. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carter. Uh, yeah, so uh, I see it's 11 o'clock now, so um, in the interest of time, unless there's anything, uh, unless our one member of the public, Ms. Wolford, uh, has any additional questions or, or requires any further information, um, or if any of the counselors that are on the call would like to speak to anything. Um, I believe that would conclude this presentation and I just want to thank everyone for participating in the 2021 budget open house. Um, just to highlight the recordings from both today's sessions will be posted on the Zook website at zook.ca slash budget and um, to learn more about how you can participate in further sessions like this please visit zook.ca slash engage and Thank you again to everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. I will now end the meeting. Thank you.